Hi, my name is Kunal, and welcome to the Geeks of the Valley podcast, which connects with some of the brightest minds globally who are leading their respective industries today to discuss the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. This morning, from the San Francisco Bay Area, we have the ex-founding team member and program director for the Thiel Fellowship and the current founder and general partner of the 1517 Fund joining us today. Please welcome Danielle Strachman. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And how are things with you uh, in light of COVID? I hear the Delta variant is hitting the U.S. uh, pretty hard uh, uh, these days. Yeah, it is true. I, I, you know, I think at least for myself and my friends in the Bay and across the U.S., um, you know, we had a few months of everyone, you know, getting vaccinated and seeing each other and hanging out. And now that Delta is in town, uh, things are things are getting quieter again in terms of events and going out and uh, and yeah, it's it, it's been a lot of transition. I think over the past year and a half plus at this point of all the all the COVID stuff, but I think um, you know I, I think we're all faring as well as one can. Um, but yeah, of course, hoping for things to get uh, a little more back to normal in terms of being able to hang out and see people. And I've been taking more in-person meetings outside and and things like that, but it's, uh, yeah, I think it's something that, you know, we all wish we're, we're more over than it is. Well, I'm happy to hear that you're all safe. Uh, let, and, and, you know, things are going well for you. Otherwise, uh, let's jump into the first question here. Shall we? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, tell me about yourself and your background and how it, led you to the path of founding 1517. Also, why the name? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the name of the fund, 1517. Uh, It harkens back to the year 1517. And during that year, um, there there was a lot of historical sort of turmoil going on. Uh, It is when a large institution, uh, the church was saying, hey, to be, you know, uh, able to get into the kingdom of heaven, you have to buy this expensive piece of paper called an indulgence. And um, this is going to make it so that, you know, uh, your soul is saved basically in heaven. And what we say about that is that we liken it to another institution today, higher education, that says the only way to be called an educated person Uh, is to go out and get a college diploma. And back in 1517, Martin Luther was the one to say, hey, I think this is wrong for the church to be saying this and for to be selling a very expensive piece of paper. And likewise, with 1517, our fund, uh, we say that it is wrong for higher education to be, you know, the only body that really gets to say who is an educated person or not. So that's uh, where we got our name from my colleague uh named us that and I remember walking into the office and we've worked together for 11 years both the, both at the Teal Foundation and through 1517 and our, I remember he was scrapping or sorry he was writing down the the numbers 1517 all over a piece of paper and I thought he had lost his mind and I said what are you doing what is that and he says oh the year 1517 and and then he explained to me the historical reference and I said oh okay yeah that makes sense Uh, So that's how we started. And then to your other question on some of my background, I always tell people that, you know, 11 years ago, had someone said, hey, are you going to be in VC? I would have said, what's VC? Um, Before this, I was a business owner, a founder of a charter school, uh, an educator, a school principal. Uh, So I was not, you know, I was not in the world of high growth startups. And I knew friends who were, I had friends who were very early at PayPal, other friends who had started other startups like Matterport. Um, but I was not myself involved in it. And it was through my work with the Teal Foundation running the Teal Fellowship Program that myself and my colleague, Michael saw, wow, we seem to have an exceptional eye for finding young talent out there. And what we also notice is that there is a gap in funding for these people when they, you know, leave the fellowship and need more support. And so we said, you know, if investors are not going to take young people seriously, especially those who do not have degrees, maybe we'll step aside from our roles at the Teal Foundation to start a venture fund. And we took that idea to our boss, Peter Teal, and he loved the idea. He loved the idea of a fellowship 2.0 that would work with people past 
the grant that we gave people. So that, that's what got us started six years ago. Um, you know, we have two funds right now that we run and, and we're going to be coming into our third fund soonish. Um, but uh, we really love what we do. And our ethos is the same to work with people who do not have a BA or a BS, deg BS degree uh, from college and to help prove out that one path is not for all. So coming off this uh, 1517 concept, uh, recently you have been focusing on trying to do more educational content and thinking of BC as a tool that is used to help and nurture founders. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, I appreciate that question. We, we really think of um, venture capital or any funding tool you have as serving a mission. And for us at 1517, really in the last six months, we've come to this, we really view ourselves not so much as a VC fund, but as an anti-establishment educational institution. So we want to be the place, you know, that any high schooler or someone who's early, maybe in their college days to come and say, hey, you know what, I have these other things I want to work on, and I don't feel like I'm getting the support that I need within the institutions I'm in. And so now I'm here knocking on your door. Um, you know, to see if we can work together in some other fashion. I think one of one of the premises that we're coming across is that young people are just not very trusted by society. People are always telling young people that they have to wait until someone else has said that they have the chops or the degree or the PhD, whatever it is, to do the thing they want to do in the future. Um, so a lot of people are kind of stopped from doing the very important work they want to do through the educational system and through sort of the job system. And we're here to say, hey, you know what? Some ideas are really important. They shouldn't wait and you should work on them now. Um, so we really see VC as a way to help fund people to do these things. And actually we are starting to come together with some new ideas for 1517 to also be able to give larger grants to people who are working on the sciences and in research to help them get going. And we do have a grant program now. We have a thousand dollar grant program uh, where we help people to kickstart R&D work, but we're also looking at building uh, something a bit bigger. So we really want to be that place that um, that people who are off a tracked institution say, hey, like this is, you know, this is the institution. This is the culture for me that's going to help me get where I need to go and isn't going to always tell me to wait until later. So I wanted to kind of go back and touch on this point about society not trusting young people to go forward and accomplish a bigger mission, or like you said, have the chops to to do to do something big, you know, at the age they are. You know, in Asia, this is much, much different. It's a very, very different perspective. You know, I know in the Valley, it's very different with the Theo Fellowship. You know, it, it doesn't matter what your age is. If you have a fantastic idea, you know, people will back you. But the mentality of thinking in Asia is so different. And do you think at some point the rest of the world is going to come around and catch up? Or do you think that stigma is going to be there for a while? You know, I think I think the stigma is going to be there for a long time. I mean, I, th I think it is sort of radical for any individual human being to say, hey, I'm going to embark on doing something that other people haven't done before, or I'm going to build a business, you know, that has the potential to be huge. And I think a lot of times people say, well, you know, why aren't you satisfied with school or your cushy job or whatever it is? Um, and people have bigger aspirations from that. But I think as a society, we're not good at helping people to get there. And in fact, I think we're too safety conscious and we keep saying, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. It's too risky. It's too big. You won't get there. One thing that Peter Thiel says, um, and I believe this is out of zero to one, is that um, you know, courage is in shorter supply than genius. So there's lots and lots of smart people out there, but they're unwilling to take a big risk and to you know, sort of make a leap um, without knowing, okay, here's exactly how it's going to go. And, and I think that this is multiplied for young people. Um, I think we live in a society where people have said, hey, you know what, the, the less risky path is to go to school, to get a doctorate degree, um, you know, to, to do these things that look like a prescribed path, um, than to do something that might be more risky, but also potentially more meaningful. And I think I think one thing that's going to be really interesting is I think that 
you know, and I'm not speaking so much to um, sort of cultural phenomenon, but I'm speaking more to maybe generational. And at least in the US with Gen Z, I'm seeing that Gen Z is very much questioning institutions and systems. And, you know, the generation that comes after Gen Z is being called Gen Alpha. And I think it's really interesting because I think I think that group is probably going to be even more skeptical of what's going on. And what I'm seeing is that young people just have access to like being a productive member of society much earlier. It's like I'm hearing about people's younger siblings who have YouTube channels, or I talked to a 16 year old the other day who had his first company exit. And it's like, okay, if you're 16 and you're having a company exit, um, okay, what is high school supposed to be really doing for you at this point? Like, yes, there's a lot of learning and knowledge that we get from studying different things, but I think we're, we're talking about potentially like large groups of young people who are gonna need very different things than what we've, what, than what we've thought about before. And, and to just touch on, um, you know, sort of culture a little bit, one of our, our founders with the Teal Fellowship, uh, Ritesh Agarwal started Oyo Rooms uh, I think it was back in 2013 ish. And he was a, you know, he, he was a solo founder to start in an early team. And, uh, you know, everyone said like, well, why are you going to try to do an Airbnb clone? And I don't think Airbnb is going to understand how to do this, you know, in India and they're not going to understand. And it did morph into what it is now, which is more of a hotel chain, but it took having sort of that insight of culture matters and the way that different places think about an idea um, probably need to be tackled by someone who's within that culture, not someone without. So, so I think that examples like Ritesh, you know, might help in other, um, other places, other countries, other cultures to see that, hey, maybe you don't have to wait until you're 40 years old to do something that's really important to you. Like maybe you can start when you're 19. So you really have this deep rooted belief that young people are underestimated. Why do you believe this? And what are you noticing uh, in young, young kids today? Yeah, I think one of my core beliefs, um, and this actually goes back to my days of starting a charter school and I ran a tutoring company and I, I've just worked with young people for a very long time. And what I've noticed about a lot of systems with young people is that there's a lot of coercion. There's a lot of, oh, hey, you know, you're five years old, you're, you're 10 years old, you're 15 years old, you're 20 years old, and someone else is going to tell you what you need to do with your time. There's this sense, and we've been talking about this a lot on our team, of that the, the new positive thing to be in the world is, um, you know, an extremely well-rounded young person, and you have to be good at a little bit of everything. And, you know, in school, you're a failure if you can't get A's in every single one of your classes. But we actually think that there's something about really empowering young people to go towards whatever their talents and passions are. And if what your talent is, is in STEM, and you're really, really good at that, why shouldn't we let that person be making some interesting contributions in that area and like really double doubling down on that instead of saying, hey, by the way, like I remember when I went to college, my class was the last class to kind of have free reign over what we did. Um, I went to a small all women's college and I remember feeling a lot of freedom actually at the time of like, oh, wow, I can take any class I want. I could even sign up for a graduate school class, even though I'm not in grad school. Like they're really giving me agency in my education to do what I think is best for me. And then the year after I finished at school, I remember they came down with like, okay, everyone has these gen eds. Everyone has to take one course from each section. And yes, I think it's important to like, to dive in and to look at other areas, but it's also at the expense of like diving in really deep to something that could be really, really important. And that doesn't have to be science or tech. It could be in the arts, it could be music. You know, if, if you look at someone who is trained in the Olympics, you wouldn't say, okay, but you know, they really, really need to also spend um, the right amount of time on science and social studies and math and whatever they're gonna do. And it's not to knock any of those things, but it's like, if you want people who are developing greatness in something, you have to go really deep in it. And there's only so much time and energy in a day. Uh, but somehow we've, we have a meme out there about young people that they have to be sort of like dabbling in everything that they do. And they have to be just good enough at a little bit of everything rather than taking whatever their natural talent is and being allowed to go really deep 
on it. And it's something that I, I saw a lot when I worked, especially with homeschoolers, where those children were allowed to go deep in a subject. I remember I was teaching a history class at a charter school that, car, char, that um, catered to homeschoolers. And this one young boy in the class, he had to be like 10 years old. He knew way more about history than I did. Like he was really deep in the subject. So I would often say, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so, please tell us a little bit more about this area because I know that you've read a lot about it. And he was thrilled. He, he loved to jump in and say, oh yeah, no, I read this and I read that and I've been to this museum. And, and it was just great. Um, you know, that that was that was fostered in him. And I don't know what he's doing to this day, but I hope he was able to sort of follow that um, because that was his particular gift. So I, I guess my point is just that I don't think this notion that we all need to be mediocrely good at a little bit of everything is um, something that's going to drive society forward. I think what it is is going to be people, including children, being allowed to go really deep in a subject, even at the expense of other things. Uh, and it's something that we try to actually foster with what we do with 1517. We don't tell our founders, you have to be good at every part of running your business. You have to be good at holding the mission. You have to be good at building a team. But those team members are going to make up for the lack uh, in the areas that you're not great at. And that's OK. So earlier in the conversation, we had kind of, uh, you know, spoken about how you were going, you know, from fund two into fund three. And if I may ask, what industries is 1517 focused in and how will the focus, you know, change between, you know, fund two and currently going into fund three here? So for us, it really is about that mission of who over what. And so we are sticking to working with founders who don't have a BA or a BS degree. We do break that thesis sometimes. We'll say we'll break it in the name of science fiction. So for example, we have a quantum computing company out of Fund One called Atom Computing. Uh, and that team is all PhD'd up. Um, but at the same time, it's also really hard sometimes for people who are working on very deep technologies to find funding. And so we'll sometimes include them in our thesis. But but, you know, predominantly it is about working with founders who fit that thesis of either having never gone to college or having dropped out of college. Um, we are industry agnostic, although we like to think about things that make a dent in the universe. Um, you know, we we want to be really proud to list a company on our website and say, like, hey, like we think that this has the potential to be meaningful to a lot of people. Um, so in that vein, we do a lot of enterprise, we do a lot of B2B, we do a lot of hardware, a lot of deep tech. Um, we've done some fintech. Um, we have we have backed a bunch of health tech companies that they have been really hard to move forward as companies. We've learned a lot in that arena. Um, and we haven't done very much in sort of media companies, no ad tech, no gaming. Um, we haven't done, we've done some in consumer, but at the same time, also very little. What we say about ourselves is that we are not cool people. So we don't know what other people are going to think is cool. So sometimes a lot of the pitches I get are, hey, I think that this is going to be a product that's great for Gen Z. And I'm like, okay, cool. I could talk to people about that and try to figure out, is this going to be something that could be big? Um, but it's just not really our sweet spot for how we do diligence. We like to talk to a customer a lot. And when you talk to a customer who's in, in an industry, you at least can have some form of a belief system that says, yes, there's other people who do this kind of work. Whereas when you're talking to a consumer oriented customer, um, it's harder to say, yes, there's like X number of people who are just like this person who's going to love this thing. So, so we do stay further away from consumer. Um, you know, but, but overall, I guess what I would say is we like to see a team with a big mission of what they want to do over the next five to 10 years. But then the opposite of that is we want them to be able to answer the question, what are you doing on Friday? Because if they can't answer the question of what are you doing this week to further that mission, the question is how do they then get started? So it's a really small sliver of people who have really big mission, who have any clue whatsoever on how to start executing on it. And so that that's one of the most important traits we look for. And then lastly, I would say we look for founding teams that are eating, drinking, and breathing the area that they're in, where they can just talk backwards and forwards about it night and day. And you can just tell it's a deep passion of theirs, whether it's because it's an interest or maybe they grew up in a family, um, you know, where they learned about a certain thing. Um, 
that sort of passion is really important to us. When people come to us with things that are like a business model innovation, that is less interesting to us because we think to do a startup takes a lot of pain and suffering and, and you've got to be dedicated to something bigger than yourself than sort of fame or fortune, which almost never comes for any company. And if it does, it doesn't come until way later. So those are some of the things we look for. And when it comes to you know investing, what are some examples of successful post-investment traits, especially when looking um, at your portfolio companies? Yeah, that is a really great question. I don't think anyone has ever asked me about post-investment traits of what we look for. And there definitely are some. Um, I mean, the, the word that really comes to mind is traction. Um, is this team able to build something that other people want? And are they able to um, are they able to sell it? essentially is that question. And so oftentimes when we're putting more money into a company post the first investment, it's looking at, okay, how are things tracking? Is this team discovering things that are interesting? Are they talking to their users a lot? Are their users raving about the product? Um, these are Those are the times when we say, hey, you know what? We should put some more cash into this company because things are going really, really well. Um, you know, and we look for founding team dynamics of, you know, is everyone working really well together? We look for the leadership capacity of the team in terms of, you know, are they hiring people? Are they able to maintain uh, the team that they've built? And are they able to sell are, are really all the questions. Um, and, and part of it too is some of it's like, it's not really, I wouldn't call them intangible so much, but some of it is just, you know, how connected do we feel with this founding team? We had one founding team very early on in fund one where they would only talk to us when they needed money. And it felt very parental um, where if we needed an update or wanted more information, it was always really hard to get it out of them except for when they needed money. And then they were right there. And so one of the things we think about is the relationship between that company and 1517 of, is the communication open? Do we feel like this person is trustworthy? If we're putting more money into a company, we really have to believe that they are doing a great job and that they're trustworthy to put more money into. And so those are, have been some of the lessons hard won over the last six years as, as we've built out 1517 is when to make those determinations and when to say, no, we're not going to put more money in here, um, you know, based on maybe things are not going as well as you'd hope. Or sometimes it's even like a spidey sense thing of we have a sense that a company isn't doing great, but they are trying to articulate that they're doing great. Um, and you can just kind of tell when things are like not going that great, but the person's telling you that everything's fine. And I don't know how else to say that, but it's just sort of something you pick up over time working with people and seeing like, this is what it looks like when a company is truly tracking strongly versus when a founder is telling you everything's fine, but it's not. So I'm guessing this is similar to the sort of traits which also stand out in founders as well, uh, which you look for. Yeah, absolutely. We look we look for all these things in founders. And, and one trait that we look for in founders that I haven't talked about yet um, is the ability to talk at multiple levels about what they're working on. Because if you're hiring people who are technical and non-technical, you need to be able to talk to every one of those groups about what you're doing. And if you're talking to different types of investors, you're gonna have some investors who are you know, deeply in your space, and then you're gonna have other investors who are more generalists who you know, might not know anything at all about your space. And so you gotta be able to talk to all these different groups. It's, one of the things that's interesting is that I feel like sometimes to be a founder, you need to be a great teacher. Um, and that's something that resonates with me a lot since I used to be a teacher. But when I, when I meet a founder who is really great at explaining things, um, there's just nothing quite like it. Because not only are they great at explaining things, but they're also really passionate about this space. So we can all think about the teachers we used to have who were like super passionate about an area and really good at explaining it. And they're some of the best teachers we've ever had. So I, I feel... Um, very blessed to be able to work with people like that. And another thing that we look for is people who can build great teams, people who know that they can't do it themselves. They're not going to be an army of one and know how to go out and find people and recruit people to something that is early, that maybe to most people sounds crazy. Like, Hey, me and these two people, we're starting this thing. And we think it could be a really big thing later. Like getting people on board for something like that is really, really hard. And so there's also a level of sort of like almost charisma that founders have to have uh, to be able to get other people to believe that they should work at that company rather than somewhere else. 
So like you just said, in order to be a founder, you must be a great teacher. So what do you think makes good value add and what makes for a good investor? Basically, what should the entrepreneur be looking for when seeking yeah. an investment? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that founders can look for in terms of investors. One is trust. Um, I tell people, like, come up with your own set of litmus test questions. Questions like, you know, if the company were doing poorly, would I feel okay calling this person? If your investor is someone who you would not feel comfortable calling when things are, are bad, um, that says something. It doesn't say you shouldn't take the investment, but it's, it says something that you should sort of think about. Um, you know, you want to think about, is this investor going to be there for you when times are good and when times are bad? Um, I would do cold references of other founders that the investor has worked with, because I think that can be very helpful. Um, one thing that dawned on me, and this is something that kind of came up this morning, actually, is that I feel like you're, especially early stage investors, they're, they're really investing in you as a person. And yes, they are investing in your product and how far along you are and things like that. But at the end of the day, you could pivot the whole company. And ideally, your investor would be behind you in that. Um, and so there's something about, I guess what I'm trying to get at is there's something about that that investor should ideally be pulling you into being as great as you can possibly be. Like they should always be encouraging you to try more and do more and be more than you think of yourself as, and not, you know, we were talking to a founder this morning and um, we were talking about how it's important to be sort of risk-taking as a founder. And what my colleague Michael was saying was that, you know, it's kind of like sailing, like the greatest sailor doesn't stick close to the shore. They go out in the ocean. And it's kind of the same with founders of like, hey, you've got to go out in the ocean and discover something. And your investor base should be supporting you to do that and encouraging you and being able to say, hey, listen, we think we're you're sticking too close to shore. You're playing a little safe right now. Like, and we think, you know, almost like a good sports coach. Where it's like, hey, we think you've got more in you than that. Um, but also investors who are willing to say, hey, you know what, we're concerned for you. We think you're working too much right now or you need a break or, hey, you know what, you need to hire on more people because you can't do this alone. Like, so it's it's this sort of blend of encouragement and support, especially at the early days. Uh, I think it was not too long ago, maybe a week or so ago, someone on Twitter posted something about how early stage investing is less about finance and more like sports coaching and therapy. And I completely agree with that. And so I think the people you're working with early need to be able to be those supportive roles. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a very long and hard journey and you need people who aren't gonna waver, people who aren't gonna say, hey, you know what, the ocean looks pretty scary. Maybe you should come back to shore um, that are okay with you, you know, taking the big leaps. But I have to say it's, it's very hard very, very hard to kind of judge that, right? As a founder, um, until you, you hit that rock, right? Until, it's true. you know, you go out into the ocean and then you're like, oh, okay, things really went sideways. <laughs> right, yeah, it is, it is really hard to judge that. And that's one reason I would say like reference checks with other founders who have worked with the person, um, you know, are good or, or asking the investor things like, hey, you know what? When a company goes sideways, what do you do? Um, you know, when a company's doing well, what do you do? Um, we're really lucky to be in the position that we're in because most of the people we work with, we have worked with in some fashion, whether mentoring them, maybe they were a grantee of ours, maybe they came through another uh, nonprofit program or something like that, um, that we often will know our founders for a while before we will make the investment. And so in that sense, they also get the benefit of knowing us for a while. Um, you know, but at the same time, I think you can tell when your investors are people persons instead of um, thinking of you as a number. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, a lot of founders who've come to me and said things like, "Oh, wow, your team is so nice." Like, you know, I the, you know this pitch meeting has been so different than all the other pitch meetings I've had, and I think sometimes it's just like the approach. And so I think it's important for founders to also listen to their gut and, and that that question of would you feel comfortable calling this person at three in the morning? Um, you know, maybe it takes some time to uh, to get there, but at the same time, you kind of know, I think as 
assessors of human beings, I think we're all decently good at knowing like, okay, who do we feel comfortable with and who don't we? And I think that's something that's important to listen to, but you're absolutely right. It takes time to build a relationship. And it's really hard when some investors expect you to make a decision after a 30 minute meeting. And you're like, wait, I'm going to take your money. And this is a 10 year relationship. And I don't know you. Um, so I would just encourage founders to try to get to know their investors as much as possible. And if it weren't COVID, I would say things like, you know what, go out to dinner, like, you know, go, go on a walk and talk with the person, like get them outside of the work environment and kind of see what they're like. Um, I think you can learn a lot about people that way, but we are in, you know, we're, we are in Zoom world. So it's a little bit harder to do that. It is, it is like marriage in a way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We talk about that with founders all the time. And it's the same thing with co-founders, employees, everything where you are signing up for a very long-term relationship. Um, but you know, you only know so much at the very beginning of it and it goes both ways. It's, it's true for us working with our companies uh, and it's true for our companies working with us. And so it is, it's a lot of trust to put on the line really early. Um, you know, so that's why I would just encourage founders like to ask questions and, um, you know, do those reference checks because you, you don't want to be, you don't want to have the wrong player alongside you because, you know, they can very much um, hurt the future of the company. So Danielle, um, 1517 is quite known for writing these, these fascinating medium articles. And you kind of mentioned this pick two mentality in your post-investment article. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we enjoy writing at 1517. I wish we did even more of it than we're doing. I probably should put out some new stuff soon. Um, yeah, but when we do a whole, one of the most recent posts I wrote um, is all about post-investment. How do we work with companies and what do we sort of tell them to get started? And one of the things that we do talk about is that there is this um, belief that if you're doing a startup, you can really only handle like one other thing. So sometimes people will say, pick two, your startup, your health, your family, your friends, your hobbies, you know, your um, nutrition, like whatever it is, your sleep, um, maybe that all goes under health, but people will say, oh, pick two. And like that sort of mentality to us means that um, you're living a pretty unbalanced life and we are all for the sprints. Um, and, but the thing is, is that what you're really signing up for is a marathon. And so we think it's really important that, yes, sometimes you do need to like be laser focused and like minimize certain things and have priorities. And in fact, I think having priorities is really important and saying no to things and saying yes to things are very important. Um, but after a while, it can't be at the expense of who you are as a person. And so who you are as a person is separate from your, your company. Um, and I think that's something that every person who found something goes through where their identity and what they're building merge together. And then after a while, you start realizing, oh, no, I think I am my company. And that's usually when people start um, noticing like, oh, I haven't hung out with my friends at all. I've gained 20 pounds. I've lost 20 pounds. You know, I haven't seen the outside in X number of months, or I haven't done this hobby in over a year or two years or three years or whatever it is, something that was really important to them. And that's often when people start pendul pendulum swinging back and saying, hey, you know what, it's important, you know, for me to get outside and see my friends and do hobbies as well as doing my startup. And what we always try to tell founders is that, yes, you need to sprint sometimes, but we think it's also something important that if you're running a marathon, that you are preserving your energy in all different dimensions and not just for your startup. Um, because you are you as an individual are your identity is bigger than that startup is. Um, and so to, just to be careful about like merging yourself with your company, and it will happen. Everybody goes through this. Um, and then you will learn to untangle. And in the anti-pitch playbook you had mentioned the general framework for building pitch decks. Can you tell us more about this and how it plays a role in what makes a good pitch? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I haven't read over that post for a long time, but it's one of our oldies, but goodies. It's called the anti-pitch playbook. And what we talk about is how to build a narrative 
um, that speaks to investors. And actually one of our founders, I think, said it really, really well. And he said it in a kind of like joking way or maybe a sarcastic way. But he, what he said is that you need a big mission narrative with minimal viable proof. And what he didn't mean was like, don't go out there and lie, lie to investors about what you have or what's been built. But hey, you're selling this big, big vision. I mean, with VCs, um, we are looking for the very definition of a venture scalable company. And that is something that can become way, way bigger than itself. Um, you know, it, it, scale means to be able to do things at scale. I, I feel like I'm not articulating this like super well right now, but it, it means being able to do something that is bigger than what your team of three people who gets it started can do. And so what you're selling to an investor, um, whether it's an angel investor, a pre-seed investor, a seed investor, is this big, big vision and mission of, hey, you know, with Luminar, for example, we are moving towards a world of safe, uh, autonomous driving where you know, now our transport is totally different. And it means that cities can be shaped in different ways and highways can be shaped in different ways. And just the idea of travel starts to change as soon as you have autonomy. And that's a huge, huge vision. Um, and then there needs to be the proof of like, okay, I wanna start working on something uh, and here's what I have. I have a scrappy prototype put together. You know, in Luminar's case, they were working out of a garage in Orange County uh, with five people and just testing things uh, sort of out in the parking lot of this facility. Um, so, you know, they didn't have it all put together, but they had just enough to say, you know what, we think we can get to the next step, uh, but we need more money to prove it out. And that's another thing I would say is investors are always looking at money as experimentation of, okay, if I give you this money, are you testing for things that you can't do already? I've had a bunch of founders who will come into you know, my office when we had an office or over a Zoom call and say, oh, we're going to hire a sales team. And I'll say, okay, well, have you picked up the phone? And they'll say, oh, no, I haven't, you know, I haven't tried to talk to that many people. Or last week I was giving a, a student team some pitch feedback and they had built out this beautiful product. It was very nicely designed. It was a, a it was a, an app to help students on campus. And I said, how many people have you talked to? And then I was hoping they were gonna say like at least 50, if not more like a hundred or like 500. And you know, one of the founders turned and said, oh, we've talked to five people. And I was like, oh, you've built this really beautiful thing, but you know, I don't know if anybody is gonna want this. Like, I think you need to get back out there and test it. Um, so, so these, yeah, these sorts of things are just very important to be able to go out there and test things in reality because investors want their money to go towards something that can't be proven out otherwise. Um, otherwise, that money feels a little bit wasteful. So we want to see that team in place. We want to see what experiments you want to run. We want to see that there's some semblance of a product in place. It doesn't have to be perfect. It could be duct tape and wires. It can be spreadsheets. Um, you know, and we want to see that you're going to prove something out that has like a big mission impact. You had kind of mentioned, you know, a big vision, and I believe like. In order to somewhat have a big vision, you have to be somewhat of a visionary, right? And I can't remember what, where I heard this, but you know what makes a visionary a, a visionary today, right? When you look at you know Elon Musk, you know Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, you know we could keep going on and, and mentioning multiple names, but it's very interesting, you know, the answer they came back with, and I and I want to kind of hear your thoughts on this. They had said that visionaries traditionally were never accepted by the world in a sense that, you know, they were always seen as outcasts or the odd one out. And because of that, they would create this parallel world in their head and have so much belief in this parallel world, that belief they would bring back to our world and utilize it to make something great. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. I think it's an interesting question of like, you know, to be a founder, do you have to be a visionary or, or like to be a visionary? What does it mean to be someone who has vision? Um, I think sometimes it can mean being an outcast. I think sometimes it can mean seeing things differently. I think for some people, it can also mean like being an inventor and not accepting the status quo the way it is. Like one of the questions that we often like to ask founders is, 
what is something that you would like to make absurd through what you're doing so that like in the in you know the future we could look back and say wow wasn't it absurd that you know for example with our company loom um wasn't it absurd that we always took meetings all the time and didn't just like you know maybe record videos and send them back and forth and have like these other communication tools um you know because what loom is really about is how people communicate and so you know i don't know what they're going to be building sort of in the future but it, it might be something where we would look back and say hey yeah you know Joe Vinay and Shahid from Loom had to be real visionary and thinking that maybe the way that we do things could be different. Um, or, you know, the inventor's mindset is kind of looking at, hey, how could something be bigger or better or just different than how we're doing it now? Um, and I think, I think a lot of our founders are very mission driven and there's sort of a humility that comes along with that. One of our founders um, is working on a therapeutic actually, and he's making good progress in it. And he's in some mouse studies um, and is actually, yeah, again, just making good progress. I can't say too much more about it, um, but he, we were on a review call with him and he said, you know, I just can't believe I'm the person who's supposed to do this. Like, who am I to be the person who's called to try to make this therapeutic that will affect a very large percent of the population? And I think a lot of our founders feel that way of that they've just kind of been called to do something and they have the ability to get started on it. And they just have to keep, I think, I think the thing about like true vision is that it pulls you into it. I don't, I don't really know yeah, I, I would almost think of it as almost like obsession of like, okay, you just can't think about anything else. You just have to do this thing. Like this thing is just a muse and it is calling you and it is not going to be quiet. Um, and then maybe the greatest visionaries that we see out there are the people who are really good at articulating that vision and saying it to other people and bringing other people into it. And so, yeah, I don't know, you're, you're making me think like, what makes for a good visionary? Is it someone who's called into a vision? Is it someone who can articulate it? Is it both? Um, I think these things are all important. And we definitely look for that kind of mentality in our founders of that they're bringing something new forth. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that we work so much with people who do not have a college degree is because we think it takes a lot of guts to tell you know your family or your friends, hey, you know what, I'm going to go down this other path because this thing is so important to me that I'm going to forego school. I'm going to forego getting a job at a company that is going to pay me over 200,000 a year. Like this is so important that I'm willing to basically not make any money uh, and work really, really hard and forego what society says I should be doing as a young person being a student to do this. And to, to me, that takes a lot of guts and a lot of vision uh, to sort of buck a whole system that most people would say, this is what you're supposed to do if you're, you know, 18 or 20 years old. But going off that point, you know, a lot of people say motivation isn't there when, when you need it, right? What do you think founders in these spots kind of need to have to sustain long-term if, if it's not motivation? That's a really great question. And one thing I want to touch on is that sustaining motivation um, is really important for us. We think that is sort of the flagship of how you keep moving towards a vision and getting something done, because there are going to be a lot of dark nights of the soul where you're saying, gosh, is this even working? Is this worth doing? Does anyone else believe in what I'm up to? You know, uh, my team's falling apart. Do I keep doing this? Or my team's coming together and now I feel responsible. Should I keep doing this? Um, so sustaining motivation in that uh, underlying current of why you're doing something is really important. And the thing that I always talk about is I think what helps people, and it's certainly, I guess I'll just speak for myself. What helps me in this arena is always thinking about who I'm serving. So it's like, you know, my personal mission is to bring freedom and autonomy to young people. And when I think about the young people that I get to work with and influence, that just always puts me right back in the right frame of mind. So that even when I'm like, oh gosh, there's a lot to do, I'm feeling overwhelmed, you know, there's fund administration work, there, I've got, you know, mail all over my floor that I need to open, like all this stuff. It's like, okay, I'm doing all those things um, because of who I serve. And I think it's important when 
someone is building something to think about that service aspect, because at least in my experience, that's what is like the, the motivating factor of being able to keep going. Um, you know, but at the same time, I think breaks are, are great and real. And one thing that I find interesting about the idea of motivation is that, um, I saw this over the pandemic. Some, I remember seeing some people tweeting out about like, oh, you know, my, uh, actually my, I saw someone say something like my brother is so bored, you know, he's taken up guitar and is like getting really good at it. And I'm like, that's not boredom. That's motivation. Like that person has found something that sparks them. And I think it's important for all of us to find that thing that sparks us, whether it's like a startup or a hobby or, you know, the people that you surround yourself with um, ideally are, are sparking like that sort of positivity. Um, and yeah, I just, I think your question is really good about what sustains motivation. And I guess what I would just go back to is that service orientation of like, keep in touch with who you're serving. Um, because that's the thing that's going to keep you going even when things get hard. That's a very interesting response. I had I'd spoken to, you know, a founder once and I'd asked them, I said, look, when, when the going gets tough and you're in your darkest days and you don't want to get out of bed in the morning, what is it that you think of? And the founder came back and said, you know, if I'm not able to do it for myself, I do it for my employees because my employees have trusted me, have, you know, left their, you know, jobs, jobs at corporates or left whatever job to work for me, have families to feed, plus I have employees to provide for. So it was a very interesting perspective because the mentality that this maybe particular person was coming from is that there is much bigger forces at play. He wasn't just, he wasn't being selfish, right? He was thinking about the greater good and being like, you know what? I might be in pain, but look at how many people have trusted me to make this company the next big thing in whatever industry. Yeah, I think that's really beautifully said. And in, in that sense, it is service to the company and the employees. Like I, I remember when I was walking around Luminar Technologies Manufacturing group in Orlando, I remember just thinking like, wow, like there were hundreds of people there. And I thought these are, some of these people are parents and they have kids and they have car payments and, you know, they're homeowners and like, they're relying on this company, um, you know, to be able to do what they're doing in their lives. And that's totally different than just working with a small, you know, team of crazy founders who want to do something. And so, yeah, I think that is great that the person that you interviewed was able to go back to like, yeah, like there are those really hard days and I get up and I do it for my employees because they're getting up and doing it, you know, for the company every day too. And to wrap up our call with our last question for today, Danielle, uh, what piece of advice would you give to our audience or people out there who are listening to this podcast from the journey you have had so far in life? Yeah, thanks again for having me. And I would say the thing I would leave people on is one of my favorite phrases is just put, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, you know, all progress is built on what you do today and then a little bit tomorrow and a little bit the next day. And so it's not about necessarily making a giant leap one day. It's about like, okay, what are the small actions you can do um, to keep moving things forward? And, you know, I think we all have this way of saying, oh, today was not enough. I did not do enough today but every day adds up. And so I would just keep telling people, you know, you know, read that, read that book, um, work on that project a little bit, practice that thing you want to practice, like, because it, it all adds up over time. And that's how you, that's how you get somewhere in the future is by all those steps you take over time. And for people who are interested in maybe catching a cup of coffee with you, it's probably uh, <laughs> back to zoom uh, coffees uh, again, but uh, what would be the best point of contact? Yeah, I would say uh, people are welcome to contact me at my email, danielle at 1517fun.com. Um, also, my Twitter DMs are open, LinkedIn, message me. Like there's, there's lots of ways to get in touch, but yeah, email is probably the best. Perfect. And Danielle, it was a pleasure having you on Geeks of the Valley. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. You asked great questions. <laughs>